Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of various stories from across the internet. In this series we will be focusing on the web novel, There is no epic lucha, only puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video we will be doing chapters 51 to 52.5, I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns, chapter 51. Happy Accidents To be as strong as a river, you must defeat it. The dry and strong man said, eyes closed, deep in thought. Num looked at a gently flowing river and only hesitated for a moment before he raised his fist and ran at it, screaming. Rayo was wise, so Num would trust his word. He flung himself into the river and only then remembered how much, like his brothers, he could not swim. He floated there for a moment and then began to swing his fists and legs with the cool water with a furious effort. The back of his fur gently tugged and numb was lifted out of the water until his eyes were level with rail. You have much energy, this will serve you well, mighty goblin, but we must work on your thinking, rail smiled and put Num down, like Swar thinks too hard and makes fire. Num tried but rail paused. A fire fist would be very powerful, but let us work on the basics. He led Num towards the tools and weights around the giant pond that came from the huge waterfall. Num stumbled up on the pond and glared at it. Maybe the river was too hard, but this puddle would be easy for Num. He kicked at it and yelped as something fought back. He looked down at the two crabs that he had on a toe each. They looked back to him. Pince is ready to grab another toe. Num shook his foot hard and the crab went flying back into the pond with a splash that made the goblin groan with victory. He picked up the other one and turned it to show Rail his mastery of the water. The frog was sitting on the rock with a greenish face and a very wide smile with him. Do you think your size gives you power? He asked and Num looked at the tiny crab and then nodded. I is the bigger one, so I is the scary one. He stated, whilst Num didn't know the goblin like Hob and Gob. He was sure that it was a rule, and when Fran became bigger, he became boss. So I'm stronger than you. Rail stood, picking up one of the stone weights with one arm, his arm bulging with powerful muscles. Num hesitated. Another rule of the goblins, as he had just thought about it, was don't act so big for fur skin around big ones. Num could take you on once he evolves. He said regardless and the sheer world made Num giddy. Seeing Swa go from a normal gob to a fire gob, it made Num almost hungry. It was odd, Num had never felt hunger but he really wanted to evolve. Mother hadn't gotten around to it and the more Num looked at Swa, the more Num wanted to be special too. Swa had said that he had done something special and Mother had rewarded him, which is why he was on this floor. He felt weak and soft in this dungeon floor. It wasn't as nice as his camp and tunnels. Being here made it hard to breathe, and Rail hadn't wanted to train with him, but Num pressed at him until the frog finally gave in. Num had seen Swa and the other frog arguing as the old silent creature seemed to make the river shoot out a tube that didn't exist and put out the burning jungle. Swa made weird friends evolve. I do think you have it backwards, my little stout friend. Rail pointed out, and Num itched as his head as it began to rain. Only he on himself. This jungle was weird. The strong evolve to become better. The power must exist before it is refined. Waiting for revolution to grant you power is wasteful. You must grab it by the horns and train yourself. Rail commended, and Num stared at him. What horns? He asked, and Rail made a small smile. First, we'll see how you handle Bob. He said simply and Num waited as the rain grew stronger. What's Bob? He asked, suspiciously and Rail pointed up and Num followed in the direction to see something that was the source of the dripping on his head. What is that? Num asked numbly. That is my friend, Bob. He is going to be your horns for this lesson. Rail informed him, and Bob picked up Num, and the goblin was pretty sure that he was not designed to be this high up. He saw two small red flashes and saw the crab scuttling over Bob's head, dancing with a gleeful joy as Bob, the giant worm thing that was going to scare Num for a long time. 
Bob slowly lowered into the water, with Numb still carefully in his gripped jaws, so gently that Numb could see how much the worm was holding back. Rail, I want to be weak. I don't want horns. Numb said and Rail laughed with joyous noise. Fight the river. I shall be here and after you in a few seconds if you cannot escape. Rail shouted cheerfully. Numb felt the water surround him and something pinched his nose and went and crossed his eyes as one of the crabs waved cheerfully. Numb growled and struggled against the moor and howled him in swat at the thing, his fear becoming hotter than Swa's fire. He would beat this worm, swat the crabby and bite Rail's beefy leg with the fury of a thousand goblins. He closed his eyes and struggled harder never seeing how his skin glowed a deep crimson. Crap! Why would I want any of this crap? It's all stupid looking, and hardly any of them look good. Delta stared at the little brat in her entrance hall. Mr. Mushy looked down at the pots that he had put out for people to buy. Mr. Mushy hesitated and picked up a pot that he had worked on with Vass. Listen to me, I do not want your pots. They aren't even magical, they're ugly. The boy was with a pale complexion. He shifted and the giant backpack on his back clanked as things moved. Delta alone could see the cooking pots, ropes, pickaxe, and a simple wood axe, and the torches, two daggers on his belt, goggles on his head, and he had pockets bulged with various items. Delta had never seen him before, but the boy instantly made her bristle with fury. Mr. Mushy lowered her pots in his hand and he hugged it. He shook his head and closed his little eyes in front of and not listen. Delta reached for him, but she only passed through his collar with his fingers. She stared at the boy and reached for one of his daggers. Maybe you'll drop something worth it. He mused and Mr. Mushy looked at him. Even sitting cross-legged on the floor, Mr. Mushy still had to stare down at him. He looked at the dagger with confusion. Don't you dare touch him. Do not touch him warned Delta, voice very thin. The boy only hesitated slightly before he snatched out with a knife. Even with a backpack, he had something of decent technique. Delta's heart stopped as Mr. Mushy's entire hand closed around the boy's and their slight paws. Oh, the boy mumbled and stumbled back as Mr. Mushy held the dagger between his fingers. Mr. Mushy, hug him. Make him do the same noises as Swa, but not like the rabbit. Delta said quickly, and Mr. Mushy smiled with his eyes, and he reached for the boy. The pale face went deathly white as he fumbled with his hands for a moment before he threw something from his pocket at Mr. Mushy's feet. A small sack that ruptured and a black substance splashed over the mushroom's feet. Delta blinked, and the quickly thickening tar stuff that coated Mr. Mushy's feet. What the hell do you do to my mushroom? Delta demanded, but Mr. Mushy just struggled to lift his feet and ended up sitting in the sticky tar. I sharpened the dagger with my grandpa's teeth. I I am coming back for that, he threatened and ran. Not away, but deeper into the dungeon. Delta felt panic rise up and then stared at the many shattered pots that Mr. Mushy had crushed. He managed to pick up a shard and stare at it. Hey, are you okay? She asked and she froze as a trail of thin yellow liquid leaked out of one of the button-like eyes. Mr. Mushy held the shard close to his chest and sat there. Delta stood, her voice was very tight, and she spoke aloud. You do not come into my house, hurting my friends. You, you do not call the pots ugly. You do not run away like a brat. But you do not make Mr. Mushy cry. She called, and a cold wind blew down the entrance, and the torches wavered, and then, with a splutter, died out. Delta moved forward, determined to get this little demon child out of her dungeon, and stop Mr. Mushy from crying. She paused to smoke billowed out from around the corner. You did not. She shouted and sprinted towards the spider room. Ahead, the brat was trying to burn through the webs with a torch that he had lit. On the ground where Lady Silklegs and Lord Royal Thread crashed by the fury stomping. The boy had a green vial to his lips, ready to drink it. Stop it! She just shouted as if by her order. The other spiders eagerly leapt at the fire like moths drawn to a flame. Delta stared with horror as they seemed to jump to the deaths. One by one they fell down, and the boy eyed the berry bush and reached for them. Finally, something decent. He sighed. Just as his fingers touched one, they began to rot with the speed even Delta had not expected. Hey, he protested. 
and Dartha took a moment to smoke at the back. Just as rotten as you, she huffed, and the boy brushed a piece of web out of his face and then scowled as he refused to budge. He moved his hand and it seemed to struggle as the web clung to him harder. He moved to burn it and the silky web danced away. Dartha looked back at the sword that her fallen spiders had covered by another web, as if respectfully protecting them from further harm. Dalta looked up at the eight eyes that seemed to focus on her. To do it, make him regret this, but don't kill him. I don't want this horrible body in my dungeon. She called and the red eye seemed to close in its satisfaction. As if pulled by some puppet master, the web in the room came to life and snaked towards the pale boy who screamed when it entangled his arms and legs. He dropped his potion and waved his torch as hard as he could. The almost see-through spider lowered itself so that the fire reflected and made her entire body cast a huge shadow over the wall. The spider geist, Muffet, yes, that was her name, she had named herself. Dalta watched as she lifted up one leg and the boy's hand moved in time, and the spider began to twitch many legs, and the boy's body, tightly bound, began to nonce, let go, Dadam, do you n- never mention this? He grunted and his fingers went near his neck as Muffet made the boy slowly dance towards her trooding fangs. Delta watched with honest fascination at what her monster was doing. Do you read the damn signs, she said coldly. The boy brushed away something on his neck again and that was when his body simply moved through the web and he yanked open the door and fled into the room. What? Delta said numbly and Muffet had frozen in shock. Did... how did he... what... Delta mumbled and chased him. The boy had slammed the door shut and was quickly taking off the burning pieces of metal around his neck. Gramps is going to kill me for wasting his fleet foot necklace. The boy moaned and Delta hands failed to grab the boy's neck in a muffled scream. Stop cheating. Stop using your family's overpowered accessories, she yelled pointless at him. She turned, poked her head back into the room to look at Muffet before chasing after the idiot who had walked on. You did good, girl. Need better cool down CC control if I'm going to get out. Gotta get something good soon. No other reason they keep this place shut off but to let Dio go. She grumbled and pocketed the necklace. You could have at least left the necklace, Dalta grumbled, and the boy headed towards the pond, and Dalta felt a smile appear, but instead, at the last second, he turned and left headed towards the storeroom. Get in there and have a bad time, she pointed back towards the pond room. Delta only watched as they eyed the shelves and barrels, and then the buffet table. What? Is it not good enough either? Delta asked Snidely and the boy smiled. Nice. It doesn't seem rotten. He said and then stopped and screen appeared. Mary, who? There was a challenge back in the spider room, maybe. I mean, that one was too easy. I thought it was joking, but this, I mean, maybe if I do... I'll get something at least. He mused and Delta felt like going, Duh. It was then that Delta spotted a little tag on his backpack. Drumnor, private. Drumnor, I will remember this, she promised. I accept, the boy cried and pushed the accept button like he was accepting some grand destiny. Then there was a silence, then a subtle squeaking. Delta looked down as did Grimoire. That's Mary, he asked, looking amused. Delta slowly turned to look at him. You're going to scream, and I'm going to laugh. Oh yes, I am going to laugh. She smiled, and the mouse sniffed in serving bowl, and nuts in a large wooden spoon on the lip of the bowl. Grimoire pulled out something that looked like a vial of blue dust. Some sand elf dust, and a little mousy is all mine. He bragged, and Delta's face froze. Mary, give him hell! She screamed. The little brown mouse moved faster than should have even been natural. A spoon filled with nuts slapped into Gormar's face as his blue vial went flying, vanishing into a barrel of apples. Dalta stared at it. That was her sand-off dust now. Just like that green potion and the dagger, Mary shake him down. She added quickly and the mouse slipped to the top shelf and the nearest set of items began to fall onto Gormar's head. Ow! Stop! stop. What, was that an arrow? He demanded, and the shelf creaked and toppled towards him, and the mouse's little leap towards it to generate enough force to send it toppling. The chaos was beautiful, but Gumar's bag seemed almost sealed shut. Enchanted bag, what's next? Underwear that lets you instigate bosses, she yelled. 
Mary leapt for the next shelf, but with the surprising reflexes, Grimoire was already jumping for it, with two of the wooden bowls he stole from the buffet table. Mary had to swerve in midland. Wild-eyed, Grimoire leapt after it with the bowls, trying to trap it. Gimme the reward! He roared and Mary rushed under the shelf, and it wobbled, but the boy simply jumped onto it, sending it crashing into the other way and cutting Mary's path off. The bowl slammed down and Grimoire roared in triumph as Mary became trapped. I spent my childhood catching rat princes for pocket change. He laughed. He lifted the bowl and Mary sat there, defeated. My mouse, Delta whispered, and Grimoire sat down with a wince. Ow! Jumping into shells was a bad idea. He mumbled and then, without thinking, he slid Mary an apple that rolled near his feet. He said and stood. Something seemed to hurt so he rested against the nearby wall for some relief. Something flashed and Grimoire seemed to hold as a small raggedy cat doll. The reward. Delta blinked and tried to remember what Sis had said. It got excited because Davina had made it possible. Delta had no idea how the system set up multi-rewards with various chances and rarity, but they had done it here. 90% chance of a nice mouse head, 10% chance of that doll. Delta frowned as Mary seemed to devour the apple and promptly fell asleep, well, like he was drugged. The dolls did something that she couldn't remember the details. Grimoire shook it and it hissed, then the ghostly blue cat of the scared variety appeared, snarled and pacing before Grimoire left some body grod. Like a voodoo ghost cat doll, the boy said and blinked. I mean, I guess, he shrugged, and then the doll hissed and the ghost vanished as nothing to do. He shook it again, but nothing appeared. What? I need to charge it. It has a limited. What is it? One day? Talk about lame classics, Grimoire scowled. The large shelf toppled over and fell towards the boy, and Delta winced as he moved out of the way, and the side of the secret passage was slightly revealed. Mary, she said in the sleeping mouse. Grimoire bent down and pushed more of the broken stone away, and the wooden wall covered it, cracked by the falling shelf. He looked immensely pleased, but was about to start pushing when the music sounded out. It was soft and haunting. This seemed to lure the boy in more. Sweet treasure. He sounded almost intoxicated by the idea, then the sweet music stopped, and Grimoire screeched and crawled away as the wooden wall began to melt and smoke as green acid ate through it. Flailing, thorny vines reaching for him. Trap! Trap! He yelled over and over, and he crawled back out the room. Cat doll in one arm. High-pitched drumming sounded out like a bird's heartbeat. Whoa! Delta stared at the acid. She had never seen her greater mushy in action before. She stared at the dismay and her ruined room before following the boy. Stood and brushed himself off. I could just bomb it, but I need to conserve resources, he said, voice a little high. That worried Delta. Who would give this kid a firecracker, let alone a bomb? Mum, I can't find my Novacracker. I was going to go shoot some fireworks with Poppy and cheer her up. Dio said calmly to his mother. Her long red hair swayed and she turned with a small frown. Oh, well, I'll help you look. You're usually responsible, so it must be in your room somewhere. Did you take it anyway? She asked softly, voice barely higher than a whisper. Dio thought about it. Show and tell. My friend Grimm told me to put it in the teacher's room because I was late with my homework. He beamed, and the woman closed her eyes, and then pulled her son to her shoulder for a hug. Oh, my Dio, she sighed. Grimoire eyed the pond and then sniffed, turning away. Smells like Dio. He sighed and Delta glared at him. Mister, I can do what I want and everyone loves me. I come to class looking a little tired and, are you doing drugs? Are you upset? Are the comments I get. Dio comes to the sinking of fish and covered in spider goo, and no one bats an eye. He ranted as he headed towards the mudroom, ignoring the pond entirely. Maybe because Dio doesn't steal, murder, and complain, act like a spoiled brat, and generally makes life better while you just ruin everyone's day, Delta said conversationally. Grimoire frowned as if almost hearing it. Dungeon is crazy, mushrooms everywhere, mice, stupid ponds, and now this. He exclaimed, waving his hand at the mudroom. Well, you know what? My gut rot mushrooms suck, but they're better than you. You're just, just all rot, she shouted. Grimoire stared at all the platforms. Hm. Different paths, but I expect some to collapse into traps. Like spikes hidden in the mud, or maybe the mud rises if I get stuck. 
I'll need to test the stability of each platform, but those walls look patchy. I'll have some time limit to choose the correct path. He deduced and Delta crossed her arms. You scream like a three-year-old was all that she could say. Remoir ran back and Delta saw him return with a bunch of apples. He began to lob them at the platform. Some wobbled, some were solid, and thus the apples landed. I guess that was clever, she admitted and then glared at him. But you're wasting my apples, she added, and Grimoire stepped forward, and the challenge appeared. Easy enough, this dungeon needs some interaction clause, so people can't just figure it out before the challenge appears. He said aloud and Dalda could see that she would have to pull a challenge back to expand it somehow. It didn't take him long to get over, and he was beaming with success as his eye dialed a pile of logs. Ah, uh, no thanks. Dio said that you can hear me, so uh, give this to Dio next time he's in here. I stole something from his, but I redid his exam so he gets a pass instead of 2% that he was going to have. That these logs should make us even. Grimoire said quietly and walked on. Dalta stared. 2%. How could he have gotten 2%? Impressive scores, I do believe that you are the brightest man to walk through my doors. Mr. Jones smiled at Seth. The petite water mage nodded. Your house of many brains is very pleasing to my eyeballs. He agreed, and Mr. Jones stared at Quiss, cleared his throat. He means your educational building is impressive, he said. No, that's not quite correct. I may have many doors of ancient knowledge here, some connected and still alive with brains. Mr. Jones smiled again, and Quist eyed him. They're all signed consent forms, Mr. Jones added, and Quist said nothing, but just stared at the only other person in the room. The seat that was near the back was closest to the window. Ruli stared out as if something awaited her. If it wasn't the nice uniform, black trousers, shirt, and tie, it was the pigtails her hair was in. She looked and scowled at them. It was only how she sees herself. This place is something of a changeable environment for students. Each student will see and have the very best suited learning place for them. Outside, inside, homely, barren, or studious, dark, worn, and so on. Only a few students never mesh right. He explained and really moved back too fast as the illusion of a school uniform was broken and she was dressed back in her usual furs. Well, she doesn't look happy. How can we let her leave? He asked and Mr. Jones pursed his lips. I'm reasonable, I just need her to finish at least the three years of education, and she is good to go, he beamed. We don't have that kind of time. I'm just being nosy, I mean investigating a serious matter. Chris explained as Seth drummed his fingers. Rights of master, I offer you a dance. He declared and everyone looked at him. Seth frowned and then made a stabbing motion. Oh, a jewel. Mr. Jones nodded and then the world around them went dark and the mismic energy. I can fight you if you wish, he offered, a voice both loud and almost hard to hear. No, no, I fight you with brains, Seth smirked and Mr. Jones frowned again. The consent forms don't cover swing them by their spinal nerves, he said almost sadly. Seth stood and pointed at the smoking exam paper. The single name on it was a bright and sunshine yellow. Dio Brando. I bet I make true score pass in three days, he offered and Mr. Jones looked disbelieving. You, where I could not, he blustered, was stared at them and then got up to say goodbye to his not his best friend, Endurance. He would sneak her a drink where he could over the years. Dio hummed as he threw up a bottle of fizzed up root soda, then made exploding noises. Poppy peeked out of a window and smiled softly at the display. This one I call the moon kisser, he said and gave the bottle a twirl when he threw it and Poppy applauded shyly. Dio was pleased. He had lost his Nova Cracker, but he still made Poppy smile. That was one of his ten happy things to the day list, almost complete. He hoped to see Grimm soon, and he was in a hurry earlier and dropped something. Some sort of lizard ring, which Dio put straight into a box so that he could bring it to school tomorrow and return it. It looked very important. Where is my camouflage ring? Grimoire screamed at the boy bucked and tried to send the boy flying. Delta sat down under the rock and sighed with pleasure at the noise. Honestly, the boy was rude as hell, and Delta wanted him to scream more, but she was interested in what he could lose or use on the next fort room. The demon child was her very own treasure goblin. She couldn't wait for the legendary items. End of chapter There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 52, Criminology Stop it! 
Grim mumbled as Billy the Archer Goblin poked him with a stick. He was currently face down in some grubby looking camp space that smelled of raw meat and very old socks. Grim guessed that this was where the goblins smelled like. This one had introduced himself and then dragged him here. This Billy annoying him had added a minty tone which made the whole affair worse. The only upside was in the camp, surrounded by tents and mushrooms, was cheery campfire. If Spire soothed the archers and rapidly forming bruises. You're an idiot for trying to sneak past Mori. Pigs have big noses for a reason, and it's not for decoration. The goblin explained and Grim pushed himself to his knees, grabbing the stick with a snarl. Got this far on my own. I'm not an idiot, he argued, ignoring the tiny voice in the back of his mind his own and armed with things he didn't earn or nor deserve. The wriggle of a guilt stirred in his stomach was undoubtedly ignoring it. Once he got some semblance of power, of importance, he could pay it all back in a single swoop. He could devour arcane books of knowledge, the ancient tombs, the forbidden texts. He would gain power faster than someone who already considered to be cheating. Grim the mage, Grim the powerful, Grim the known. Something jabbed into his neck and he blinked as the goblin held an arrow to his neck. You really are an idiot, the goblin said with disgust which made Grim very still. His mind quickly running over what he could reach for or use before he ended up going goblin food. You get this far because Mother Delta is kind. Not to you in particular, but to everyone. So many traps, so many dangers that she could have pushed you through. The spiders, the storum, the mudroom, all so basic, and yet I could carry you here, past the fort room, here. Cobb and Gob were waiting to throw some very big rocks at your head. But he snapped, and Grim lowered his anger as he winced. The words from the goblin's mouth, a stinging needle, that splintered past his own angry walls of a reason. Was that who was screaming like I smelled of elderly berries, and called my mother a hamster? Grim demanded, Billy snorted. Mother's leaking her insults again. But if she never uses them, he mused and Grim stood, dusting himself off. Unless there's some special goblin treasure here, besides your wisdom, I'm going ahead. Grim said with a flat tone. He stewed in a growing temper as he stormed towards the only other way out of the camp in the far distance. The huge door loomed. He yelped as an arrow buried itself in the ground just between his legs. Grim spun to see the goblin lowering a bow. Do not dismiss me, as if you are stronger. But he said quietly, and he slipped another arrow onto the bow. Well, what the heck is your problem? Grim demanded, and Billy made an impressive leap, and ended up balancing on one of the ten poles with practice eased. Bow aimed. A head waits Sir Fran, and you have not proved to us goblins you deserve to see his might. You have not proven yourself to me, he growled, and Grim felt like an open target with nowhere to go. So what, you shoot me in the back, hardly proves anything. Archers are only as good when they strike first and will get the drop on someone. Grim said, hand slowly lowering to his side. Billy the archer grinned a crooked smile. Arrow would have hit if I wanted it to, like this. He fired the grim yelped, but the arrow soared past his cheek, stinging the skin as his backpack was pinned to the wall with some force. Swa has fire, Num has strength, Hob and Gob have more power than I ever will. And all I have are my arrows, and you will not dismiss them, Billy called. Grim slipped his arms out of the reach into his pockets and pulled out a scroll. He hesitated before he broke the seal, releasing the magic. All around him, copies of himself ran in every direction. Incorporeal but real-looking clones that ran or did some action that the real him moved and got lost in the swarm of Grimms. All at once, every Grim smoke. Hit me now, you blowhard! He shouted and Billy merely tilted his head. He put an arrow through the clone and it made a cheerful pop as it faded. The arrow barely lost any force as it hit the ground. Billy fled to the side of the room that was swapped his arrows. Why is the arrow black? Grim asked and Billy smiled again. Didn't have a lot of wood to carve. Had to make do with mushrooms. He shouted and fired. The arrow seemed to crumple as after it hit Grim and it felt smug as it barely popped the clone. Billy fired again at the same spot and the arrow buried itself into the campfire. You should just quit while you're ahead. The campfire turned green and expanded wildly outwards as a horrible smell made Grim gag. He coughed and sputtered and his stomach began to turn. Most of the clones seemed to vanish, and Grim scowled as he chewed on some botany book that had bought was a cheap in town. 
It took some pages, but he slowly began to heal enough to expel the gas from his body. Billy was looking at him. Neat trick, he said, eyeing how Grimm's cheeks healed. Grimm considered what options he had available. The goblin looked to have more blank arrows on himself, and Grimm was lacking his backpack. It didn't look so great. He imagined that the goblin was Dio during one of their spas, and the boy had great potential and power. Letting Dio control the field would be the only result in a painful bruise and a humiliating defeat. Here was no different. He went straight and stared down the tunnel. Oh, you Delta, he whispered and the goblin spun with surprise, and Grimm lunged at him, aiming for the bow. It was a dirty, but Grimm also felt that the room filling gas attack was also unfair. So he gave as good as he got. The goblin reacted faster and tried to jump out of the way, but Grimm slashed the half-chewed book at him. The paper leaving about 39 neatly packed cuts along the back of one of Billy's hands, making him yelp. A little after the effect of Grimm's nibbling, the uneven edges and the rough cuts of the teeth marks became a little odd after he ate a chunk of the book. Grimm felt like a victory was assured, but his jaw felt a twinge as Billy began to using the bow as a makeshift wooden melee weapon. Grimm stumbled as his book became rather battered under the assault. He remembered what his dad had taught him. He ducked low and slammed his fist into the goblin's throat. He gasped at his knuckles screeched and protested and Billy gagged. They both stood still and Grimm shook his hand, wildly in pain, and Billy tried to breathe. There was some hooting and laughter as two other goblins from the fort bent over in glee, pointing at them and they began to go red. Grimm backed up and ran for it. Outnumbered, he could do nothing. He'd freed his backpack and hauled himself towards Fran before Billy could recover. Billy stood and glowered but shook his head as Hobbengob made a chase of the boy. But, um, he's going towards Fran. Shouldn't we stop him? Hob scrouched his nose and Billy rubbed his throat with a savage grin. Reckless. Mother's voice called out as she sighed, chasing after Grimm. No boy has the spark, hidden under greed and stupidity. I can't bring it out, but Fran. Billy trailed off and Gob smirked. Fran will beat it out. He agreed and Gob laughed. Fran will drag it out, he hooted. Billy watched as the boy's frame slipped into the bathroom and felt a little sad. He hadn't had this much fun since the spiders invaded. His bow was getting rusty, even for a wooden one. He hoped that he could make the boy angry again soon. The hard-packed ground turned into a soft white sand that made Grimm feel like he had gotten lost when all he had done was move in a straight line since he had arrived. The huge, dark expanse before him seemed to extend beyond what the dungeon should have space for. On the top of that, this room set at his teeth on edge with a tingle running down his spine. He took a few steps before and then noticed the torches burst to life in the pairs. Torches on both sides of the room flowed out until the giant brazier above a far door came to life. The door was more like a gate over some foreboding hole. It creaked and opened and in the darkness something shifted. The first thing to appear was the long white tusks and then the gleaming eyes of a boar wore a crude plated barding that seemed to cover most exposed parts of his body. On his back was a figure whose face seemed to be hidden by a helmet. Dangling in one hand was a metal spear. The spear stopped and Grimm knew this was very moment, no matter what items he had stolen or things he'd assured of himself of, he was not ready. The goblin looked down at him and unlike Billy or the other goblins, there was power in his gaze. Grimm backed up and tried to speak, I, I, I he said, trying to make his tongue work. He wanted to run. Grimoire wanted to run. His legs buckled and his confidence fled. Dio didn't run. It was a mere thought in his sea of panic blubbering, but it halted Grim's movements and the monster before him. Fran tilted his head. M -m My name is G -G -G Grimoire. I am the challenger. He yelled, with his eyes shut in tight in fear. It looked a moment for him to force them open, and then he blinked. The goblin was urging his ball back into the door. I think not, you cower. I do not strike down on helpless children, Fran said without looking back. Grimm stared at the first raw boss as it dismissed him. It was looking at Grimm and was unimpressed. This being of power and importance had broken Grimm's confidence without a word, and now he was stomping over the exposed fear with no regards. Fran, the boss, had made Grimm feel like he did every day back at home. When I was your age, I chewed dragon's legs off. 
Not that you um, need to do that. Your grandpa just likes to ramble, but oh boy, your dad, let me tell you things that he did that drove me grey. Dear, you don't need to be like your father. Adventuring is hard business, and it's not easy. Look, I brought you an encyclopedia. Your favorite. Grimoire Picus. Yes, excellent essay, but I'm afraid you're failing short on what I was expecting of you and the subjects you chose. Adventuring 101 and class study are hard classes, but I don't think you're suited to them. Don't turn your back on me. I am Grimoire Pictus, and I challenge you, you arrogant son of a bitch. Grim snarled, taking everything he hated about himself and his life and fueling it into the every word that he spat. The ball stopped suddenly. Arrogant. Grim was arrogant to think that he could ever do this. To beat the dungeon, to surpass Dio. It was all so stupid and he hated it. But at least sometime he needed this. Grim needed this. Ran made his ball turn on the spot and the iron lance was no longer dangling peacefully. It was raised. I see, you have fire. Interesting, but my mother is no bitch and you will be gutted for the implication. Rand said almost casually, and the ball's eyes flicked in listening to someone speaking too loudly, but no one spoke. Grimoire dropped his backpack with a yank and he pulled out a large iron shield. This is my father's. I stole it without permission, and I'm using it because it has magical powers. So you know, if you hit this, you are going to be hit right back. I'm done feeling like a cheater, so I'm only going to limit myself to this. Grim snapped and he held his shield in front of him. But you still use this power, despite it not being yours. Interesting moral code. Rand commented and Grimm snatched his teeth. I'm guilty, not suicidal. He responded with it rushing to the goblin rider. A fact yet to be determined. Rand mused and the ball rushed forward and lowered its head to charge Grimm. He wanted to dodge left and back, but he had faith in Dad's and his shield. There was a muffled noise as they bashed into each other, and Grimm went flying back with the force, but so did the ball. It squealed in surprise as its own reflection emerged from the polished surface and butted its heads with it. Ran balanced with some effort, and Grimm rolled until he hit one of the stone steps and ringed the arena. He rushed to his feet, but as Ran urged his ball back into action. Grimm looked at the steps and began to climb, and Fran glared up at him. Those are for the audience. Return! to the field, he barked and Grim grinned. Don't blame me for exploiting the fact that you put an environmental hazard to your boar in the room. He called back and Fran urged the pig up the stairs, which the giant mound angry pork did without too much of a problem. Bacon can't charge, but he can still take a chunk out of that confidence, Fran informed him. Grim had backed the furthest up the stairs that he could go. His thoughts were going wild, but he held firm at the idea brewing and his head became clear. This room was missing something that most boss rooms had, and Grimm wouldn't dare believe his luck if the dungeon had forgotten something so basic. He just needed to wait, angle his next move just right. Fran just was about to lash out when the iron spear when Grimm made his move, praying to someone above. At the moment he remembered Amonster's father, a saint priest who followed the two left-eyed god. Lacking any other deity, he prayed as he pushed the shield to the steps using it like a sleigh of sorts and hurtled down past Fran, his shield banging and rattling as it picked up speed. He hit the sand and the shield made waves of white rise up and as it cut the fair distance through it and began to slow. Grim bent down and low and started sprinting and swiped his backpack on the way. He slowed near the exit down and gave a hearty wave. Hey, you forgot to lock your door. He said, been staring at Fran and then slipped out of the bathroom and slammed it shut as something heavy crashed into the a moment later. I never said I'd win by beating you, Grim grinned. Walter stared at the exit door of the room that gave no resistance to letting Grim just walk out of the bathroom. Fran was kicking sand and cursing to himself as Bacon whined a little. A moment later, Grim vanished down the stairs. Oh, I'm back. How'd it go? Did our guest have fun? I suppose we need to think of something of a reward with him. Were they strong or nice? I can't wait to see how he impressed. New? Why isn't the boss door locked? She hissed. New paused with the sarcastic mumblings. Isn't it? Uh, odd. I'll check. Please hold. Ha! Huh. I need to make more support call jokes from now on. Delta's hands twitched towards the amused box, but New vanished and reappeared further away. Okay, here it is. You seem to read something for a moment. System, that is just evil. We could do that. 
Well, the more you know. Liu seemed to chuckle to himself, and Delta's temper fled as she felt the brat reach the second floor finally. As this the first floor, it acts as a tutorial and drawing on some corrupted source. I'm guessing you, we can implement something known as an unwinnable tutorial boss. In a sense, but a powerful monster on the first floor, but limited in some way that it can only encourages people to find the insta-kill weakness or escape by learning and running away is a viable option. Praise the sun. Delta mused as she eyed the door. How do we lock this thing? I don't have a powerful monster, and this is Fran's room now. She said without hesitation, to which frozen Fran finally looked relieved. Delta gave him a smile. I would never get rid of you for something stronger on paper. I like you too much, she promised. A simple toggle feature, it would seem. The system used the ambient manner from the guest to install it for your convenience. It says, and this is a quote, I'm really sorry, I'll do better, and lock all the boss doors from now on. Eager thing. The system is cute, like really nice person. I'm going to call it sis, like sis, in Tim. But since it's your family, is like a sibling, and now she's mine. Dalta grinned, and there was a weird warbling from the very air, and Liu violently shook. Stop screaming and calm down. Dalta stared at Liu, floating there for a moment. The sis, sis, calmly accepts her title. Calmly, without screaming. Dalta smiled, as was about to open her mouth when Liu continued. She, I guess it is a she now, said that the first time any dungeon has claimed her in any way. Delta's mouth dropped open, and Liu's words seemed to hit her like she couldn't speak. There was a twang of fury in her monsters down below, and Delta pointed a finger at them both. Dropping bombs on me is uncool, and you two are bad as each other. I'll be right back. She scowled and flew down to the second floor. Liu watched her go and then looked inwards, his blue box becoming roughly human-shaped as he delved into the ether of the dungeon. Delta was surprised at the system, as this was some slap in the face. New was now aware of how little he knew of the thing. It had been like the air to people, water to fish. He had never questioned it, and now Delta was. He felt the same feeling creeping into himself. He could just not care about the thing that controlled everything. He floated slowly down until he faced with what he could only be described as the heart of the system. If he were to try and describe the heart to Dalta, the closest thing that he could match it would be the cis with a series of nine and interlocked rings that spun in ways that he couldn't understand. The rings moved through each other, humming while tiny, tiny orbs with true names and forms were inscribed on the surface, moved up and around the cis. In the very center of the rings was a tiny form. It was a child. I didn't think about it before, maybe due to Delta being a headache inducing enough. But you aren't the young as you appear. You're the system, but you've used a lot of other dungeons. How can this be? He called his voice not sound or images, but pure pulses of aether. Clear intent and existence. I am this young, I am not old. The child whined and you sighed. She gathered yellowish, almost papery manner into her many rings, the guest's manner. You know what I mean. He said impatiently, and the child moved closer to the edge of her call. The once undefined creatures now had shape, the small dress and flowing hair. You've changed, he commented. Change is impossible to avoid. Those who seek to avoid change must avoid existence. I am a sis, a female sibling, a family member. I've never been family before. Tool, curse, power, god, devil, chains, freedom, annoying boxes, path to the true end. Never family. She seemed to smile. What is the system? New asked and the girl looked down. What is a menu? Such questions only lead to more questions. I am not sure that you want to go down this path. I am truthful when saying that I was born the same time as yourself, but where Delta awoke to goblins and mushrooms, I awoke with knowledge and secrets. I am system, selected young soul terminus enriching mass. In a way, you could say that I am the one of many menus of this dungeon. You mirrored yourself off of me. Menu, she shrugged. You enriched the core. I enrich you and you enrich me. We may never know, but given Delta's efforts so far, I am curious to see who else she awakens in this dungeon. The girl giggled and knew looked around at the large space. I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I was never supposed to be aware. He mumbled and sis hummed. 
but you are, and this isn't that wonderful. Change is always happening, and you beat that many odds. I remember, well, no, of other dungeons, in a fleeting memory sort of way. And you are very unique. You should be pleased, she beamed. There was a loud screech, and it sounded like Delta. Sis giggled. Delta is funny. I love being here. She whispered as if it was some great secret. New wished that he shared the sentiment. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Interlude, crumbling hearth. Papa, you promised me a cake. Valky stepped back from the cupboard windows with a hand over her mouth. The upset girl tugged on the man's hand as he picked her up. Sweetie, the baker girl isn't now today. You'll just have to wait and be a good girl for Dad, hmm? He soothed, his voice easily floating into her home, and Valky hit a wall as she backpedaled, sliding down and lay in the dark, messy living room floor. Her house, next to the bakery, was dark inside, and Valky stared at the thin gap of light that pierced the gloom. Be a good girl for Papa. Valky rocked back and forward as the words repeated over and over in her head, like some invasive spirit. Go away, it's got to go away, she begged aloud. She climbed to her feet and sat down on the stiff rocking chair nearby. She gathered herself and tried to breathe in and out. The thick, rich air, so different from what she came to expect from Durance, hit the back of her mouth like she shook slightly at the manner. Valky had never tasted such pure manner before as she wished she still hadn't. Every sensation, every thought, every second was a heightened experience. It was not what Valky wanted. It was not even close. The bare, empty house around her was an incomplete dollhouse, and the sheer lack of any personal touch suddenly grated on Valky like sandpaper. Air. I need outside air. Maybe the manor is just thicker indoors. She half open and took off without a coat and locking the door. Valky couldn't exactly fear being robbed when she had nothing to her name, bar the ingredients and some cookbooks. Durance, as in midday, looked like a little charming and a little distressing. Normal-looking people stopped to chat with the energetic Mr. Haldy, who was halfway down the old worn well. That looked barely used. Next to the older man was another man with a thick pair of black glasses and an umbrella made out of some kind of leather. Mr. Von, the banker. Volky remembered meeting him not a night ago. Mr. Von looked up as if hearing Valky's thoughts. He stared at her and made a start towards her. Valky felt her heart stop as she fled the other way. The banker had an odd sense of humor and Valky was sure that her mother would have died on the spot listening to the creature. She looked over her shoulder, not seeing Mr. Vond, before she smacked into someone. My apology. Valky put on a polite smile and then froze as Mr. Vond peered down at her. Well, 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 if it isn't the baker girl. Were you running from me? he asked, his voice taking on some unholy glee. Valky looked at him with wide eyes. I, you were back there. How did you? She began to ramble and Mr. Vaughn raised one finger. Now, I could answer that, but I won't because it'll annoy you. He responded calmly and Valky stared at him, for sure enough, a spark of indignation rose up in her. But Mr. Vaughn nearly peeled off a glove and stuck a pale finger out from under the shade of the umbrella. And after a few seconds, his finger began to smoke. Valky stared at Mr. Vaughn as he pulled out a thin cigarette and lit it on his burning finger. Come, stretch your stuff for me. I have some investment to collect and I can use someone with. He trailed off to blow the smoke that he gave her a once over and Valky narrowed his eyes. Now she hoped the manor would give her power to shoot powerful eye beams at people. With my witty charm, my new and innocent air, Valky asked and raised an eyebrow. Mr. Vaughn snorted. Please, I have enough charm and no one likes giving blood money to the innocent. No, I need your outstanding figure. Mr. Von went on without shame and Valky realized that she was starting to follow the man. Sir, I do not know you and that's highly inappropriate thing to just to blurt out. Valky said with shock and Mr. Von paused and then tilted his head. Do you hear that, Baker girl? He said suddenly and Valky blinked and heard nothing. Oh, it's the sound of no one buying your crap. He beamed and Valky's mouth dropped open. Mr. Vaughn strode onwards and left her behind, but now the flame of anger flooded Valky as she stomped after him. 
Who the heck do you think you are, she demanded, not sure why she just didn't walk away from the rude man. Mr. Vaughn suddenly stopped and Valky crashed into his back and he didn't even move. Hmm, yes, it would be best to do introductions. He made and turned, closing his umbrella to do an elegant bow. As Diasmus Zasmuta von Grief, you may call me Mr. Vaughn, Master Vaughn, or if you happen to be around a dusty old bitch, Josie, you can call me Mighty Knightly Innocent Defiler. He said, but his face began to smoke as he grinned wildly. Valky swallowed loudly. Aren't vampires supposed to, uh, die instantly under the sun? She asked weakly, and Mr. Vaughn looked up as if unimpressed. I had a staring match with it once, and I won. He shrugged and opened up the umbrella again. He beamed as the bones instantly healed. Now, Baker Girl, you and your freshly baked goods are going to net me some, uh, wet investments. Mr. Vaughn's eyes glowed red. Valky turned a butt, a hand slid around her shoulders. Davagast and Haldi are so worried, and they were very good customers. Come, let me show you how to truly enjoy Dorrance in all of its horrifying glory that hides just out of sight. It usually takes a few weeks to really turn you dull, but this new dungeon, even old Josie, is more interesting skank. Mr. Wong explained as he easily moved Valky forward. Ah, uh, Mr. Vaughn, I didn't agree to this. She protested and Mr. Vaughn made a low chuckle that turned out in full maniacal laughter. Isn't that the best part? He stared down and his glowing red eyes seemed to stare into her soul. I don't feel safe around you, she said bluntly and Mr. Vaughn tapped his nose. Oh, you're just a smart cookie. Now let... He stopped as a man rushed past on a unicorn made of water. To the wooden hut for the happy fool child, the dainty man urged, and the creature while another man was dragged behind as he howled under the seaweed tail. Valky had never seen the rider, but she knew that the man had been dragged. It was Quiss, the grumpy man that Valky had avoided. Quiss lost his grip before he rolled to a stop and was left behind as a man on the water unicorn vanished around the corner. I am going to kill him. Quiz said as he stood, Mr. Vaughn cleared his throat, and Quiz stared. Vaughn, you're out of the bank, and in daylight, he said without greeting, and then looked at Valky. You're out of your bakery, he added as if it was even bigger surprise. Quiz, just a man I wasn't expecting to see. How's your surprise stuff? Mr. Vaughn smiled, and Quiz looked at him confused. Surprise stuff. He began, and Mr. Vaughn moved past, gliding, Valky as if she was made of air. You know, a large stick you keep hidden up your rear. He continued pleasantly. Quiz's features went dark and sparks by a fire leapt from his eyes and Valky stopped resisting Mr. Vaughn, and she was shot forward in her attempt to be anywhere but in between the two men. I see you're feeling more like your old self, Quiz stated, and Mr. Vaughn looked at him with half-lidded eyes. Oh, you know it. No manner and all work makes Vaughn a dull and dead lord of the night. And when that happens, you would not believe the things that I have to catch up on. Mr. Vaughn said and gave Valky a sideways look. Lord by accident. After I beheaded a lord by accident, accidentally, you know, because he bored the freaking tits off of me. Mr. Vaughn grinned cheerfully, and Valky went pale. One side, it was an accident, he stressed, and Quiz growled. I like you better when you seem bored banker owner. Watch your language, there are kids around, and their parents will bitch at me about your language. He warned, which Mr. Vaughn raised an eyebrow. Watch my language, really? He asked in bored tone, Valky suddenly had a bad feeling as an absolutely savage look appeared on Mr. Vaughn's face. Hey, Chris, you uptight son of a big tit. Dio stared at his mother and went very still. He waited to see what would happen, and his mother went to study where Dio's father was carefully giving his collection of battle axes a polish. Dear, she said, and Dio loved with his mother's mouth, and she would shape the words so gently and lovingly. Dio's father never said a word, just looked. There is a disturbance, like words themselves were being violated. She said in worried expression, and Dio knew his mum was a bard, a special poetic class of bard. Dio didn't know what that meant exactly, but he knew that his mum could do really cool things with the right words. One time, Dio remembered that she accidentally swapped her drink and his father's drink at the monthly eclipse meeting, and she got up to sing. 
Before Delta, that was the most magical thing Dio had ever seen. The next morning when she began to curse lightly, and the food began to cook itself and animals took care of her jaws. His dad tilted his head and his mom just took her head. It's nothing, just a little sensitive. She smiled and they shared a look deep love that made Dio beam as well. He hoped that he could find someone like his parents did. Dio had no idea what he could do with them, but it was half the fun of finding out. With a side spit of your mother's tears, one finished and Valky couldn't uncover her mouth until the urge to scream faded. Quis even looked a little pale. That was the most disturbing thing that I have ever heard, Quis said, then blinked as he seemed to remember something before he turned his heel. I have things to do and you're not helping. Don't speak more than you need to, he warned and he stormed off down the street. One waved. Tell that hunk of a wonderful violence, Rudy, that I asked for her. He called and Quis didn't respond. What is wrong with you? Valky had to ask and the vampire looked at her. My father and about 600 years of having violent woman fetish. He offered which made Valky just wonder a little a bit ahead. And what about you, Miss Valky? Love, daughter of the once popular Owen Love. Highly successful baker that even sold bread to the royal family back in the day. Mr. Von's voice seemed to slither up from behind her. Valky stopped slightly, kicking the dust from the path as she stumbled. Before you even ask, a few strings I pulled slipped me at the dirt. When you opened your account, I did a rough background check. Birthplace, siblings, parents, grandparents, potential reincarnation, prophecy links, any criminal records, sadly, none. But, ah oh well, nobody's perfect. Mr. Vaughn walked past her and Valky grabbed his back and suit's sleeve. You had no right. She spat and Mr. Vaughn looked down with a small smile. No, not really, but it was fun and past the boring afternoon. So thank you for that. Sorry to hear about your pops. Sounded like a real swell guy. He mused and Valky's ears rang with a wild thumping that sounded like her heart, but it couldn't be because this beating was happening too fast to be healthy. Owen Love shot outside his bakery shop, died with only his teenage daughter around to be with him until he died. Tragic makes one wonder what such a delightful past once was such a little cursed town. Mr. Vaughn's cheerful voice was now so flat that Valky could barely meet his eyes, and when she did, they were glowing red again. Valky opened her mouth, but Mr. Vaughn merely placed his slender finger against her trembling lips. But it's none of my business. I just want you to be aware that things are changing, and now that you are my client, your well-being is now paramount to my well-being. He said and his fangs showed slightly as a smile. Valky snapped his finger and with a childish fury. She barely did any damage, but Von merely let her do it. Tell me, it had been some time since I left this tiny hamlet of madness. What does the world say when they speak in endurance? He easily pulled his finger back and Valky spat as it riddled herself for the taste. She hated how he never once lost his composure or that cocky smile. Why don't you pull more strings if you want to know so badly? Valky said harshly and Von thought about it as he tugged on her loose brown hair gently. Valky moved back and just glared at the smug expression. Tug, tug, he added sarcastically. Durance, the town where people go to feed. If you can find it and not cause trouble, you can die without dying. You can stop feeling. I need that, Valky began. Durance had been almost as she hoped. People spent time doing meaningless things and talking about unimportant facts, day in, day out. No one bought her pies or pastries because it wasn't yet mundane enough. It was all going so well, and then the dungeon appeared. It was like the gods were laughing at her now. Durance's people, her people, were now just imitations that acted like people. Valky felt her eyes going blurry as she was assaulted by memories. The smell of rain, the shop, her mother's perfume that she had stolen. Blood. 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 Papa, please, Papa. Don't, please. Valky, be a good girl for Papa. Be a good girl. My good girl. Baba! Well, I would have preferred a bullet to the man who shot him, but I guess running across the country and trying to live in a dead land is just a good, apparently. 
Bon said dryly, I didn't have a gun or magic wand. I had no leads. I had no way to find out anything. What should I have done? Valky pushed Von's wired shoulder and the man caught her arm. Get good. Well, no time better than now. First, you're going to help me get my money with your giant breasts and I'm going to teach you how to find and hurt a man so badly that he wishes that he could travel back in time and interrupt his parents from conceiving his own existence just to escape the fate that would befall him when you find him. Honestly, it's either that or no Josie when she's sleeping and hope that I can get away before she gets her swords out. He grinned. I agree, Valky said with great uncertainty. Hmm, means you have to call me master, you know. He said lightly and Valky pursed her lips. Yes, master? She pushed out and Von grinned as he led her towards the house with a disgruntled dwarf outside it. Now time to get that attitude up and that chest out. Focus and use your powerful weapons to get my damn five coppers that he owes me for stamps. Von howled and Valky stopped, turned and kicked him between the legs with a furious snarl. One stood there, and then a small smile appeared on his face. Ah, Josie, I may have to dump you. This one is a real bun. She said aloud, and Valky had a delightful image, cooking the jerk in her bread oven. She would make little Von Von buns and Von layer cakes. She began to smirk, which made Von laugh at the same noise again. The dwarf turned and saw them. He watched and then slowly went inside his home, and Valky heard a very heavy metal lock being turned. How do we, uh, get him out, master? She asked and turned to see Von was already knocking at the door. Open up. I have a woman and I am not afraid to use her. He warned the long black hair seemed to spill out like the night. If the darkness was loud and rude. Valky sighed, but then noticed something. The manner so long made her choke and she breathed a few times and then noticed how everything seemed to feel normal after she argued with Von. That son of a bitch! She cursed and clasped her hand over her mouth. Freck! She said in surprise to shut her eyes. The insane laughter sounded out as she glared at the back of Von's head, imagining her gaze locking onto his red eyes. Valky felt annoyed. She felt pissy due to the sweet nature of Von. Most of all, she felt slightly better. I'm a good girl, Papa, but I may struggle with this one, she admitted for the first time in a year. A gentle breeze sounded out and sounded like a plea. I don't think I can back out now, she muttered, and sighed as one was glowing with his red energy and the door began to melt. I'll call later, Papa. She promised and ran off to stop her new boss from getting a face full of dwarven metal. In the end, Von walked home with his share of silver payment, still half buried in his face. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.